Good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to have you with us uh, for the latest event in the Injury Rehab Network brought to you by Basra and Steroplast. Tonight, we're discussing osteopathy in football with Dr. Carl Todd. Before we get underway and I pass you to Andrew, I'm going to run through some housekeeping for anybody that's not joined us on one of our sessions before. If you want to introduce yourself in the chat so we know who we've got in the room, please go ahead and do that. It's always great to see the range of different professions that we have represented in the range of different countries we have represented. We're always really grateful for your support. So pop in the chat and say hello. If you have a question at any point throughout the webinar this evening, please pop that in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Also have a quick skim of the questions that have already been posted because somebody might have had the same thought as you. And instead of retyping it, you can just upvote that question and it will bump it to the top of the list and increase the chances of that being answered at the end. We are going to send you out certificates of attendance if you're joining us live for the session this evening and you'll get those tomorrow by email. The recording is going to be made available to people who've registered for the event. And again, we'll send out the link for that recording so that you can check back in on any of the slides um, or content that you've come across in the presentation. Again, for anybody that's not been with us before, um, it would be remiss of me to not introduce Basrat, who we are and what we do. We're the professional association and regulator for sports rehabilitators in the UK. We've regularly been running these CPD webinars in partnership with Sterosport, which started uh, at the beginning of COVID back in March 2020, and we've done around 30 since. You can support our work, including these webinars that we put on for free by joining us as an associate member and the benefits of doing so are listed there. If you're interested in that, just drop me an email after the event. Andrew, I'll bring you in. Uh, I'll remain in the background for techie stuff. I hope you all enjoy the event and, uh, and get lots of great learning from it. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining, as always. Um, appreciate it's uh, kind of a, an in-between time of year and busy, particularly with lots of people getting ready for getting back to work. Um, I know lots of people have heard of this introduction before, so I'll keep it brief. Um, I work for a company for, called Steroplast and um, our sports division is, is Sterosport. Our background is in medical and healthcare sectors, so essentially consumables. So really <clears throat> anything that you'd find in the back of an ambulance, um, but for sport, it's pitch side first aid, tapes, therapy equipment, emergency and trauma equipment, um, exercise rehab and, and pharmaceuticals as well. We're really pleased to be working with an increasing number of teams and sports organisations and, and sports uh, rehabilitation professionals. So if, if you're looking for a partner to work with them, please do um, get in touch. Um, our sport website has all of the different products on and you can use that discount code um, to get uh, money off. Um, we've also worked with colleagues from University of Salford on a series of online sports taping courses. So um, please do have a look at that out for that as well if, if they're of interest. Uh, if you could just move on, Ollie. Um, so with the Injury Rehab Network, as Ollie said, we've been delivering the events with Basra um, on an online basis since lockdown in 2020, early 2020. And um, really pleased to, to do that. And it's great to see um, another global audience at, at this event today. The uh, group initially started um, the year before that in 2019 on a face-to-face -face basis where we saw an opportunity and the need to work with some of our partners from the Northwest to um, give them an opportunity to collaborate, come together, do a bit of networking and hear from some expert guest speakers and the events have continued to, to go really well both through lockdown and after lockdown and it's brilliant that so much engagement from Basrat members and others from the uh, sort of sports medicine and sports rehabilitation community so thanks very much for, for your support if you do have any ideas for future guest speakers or topics to cover um, we're very um, very much open to, to ideas so please do let us know you can see there some of the events that we've got coming up um, so um, stay involved and keep an eye out for those we're also um, quite a long way through um, we've got a good schedule becoming lined up for 2023 already uh, as well um, so this year we've had some some brilliant guest speakers and um, really really grateful to Carl for, for, for giving up his, his time and we've never had um, a talk from, from an osteopath before and particularly someone that's working in uh, professional and elite sports so um, 
really looking forward to, to Carl's presentation. So um, I'll let Carl introduce himself, but thanks again for joining and thanks very much, Carl, for, for taking the time out to, to share your, your slides with us today. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you. Uh, I'll just wait until you can put my presentation back on, maybe, I think. Have you got it there, Carl? Are you able to share it? Uh, I didn't stop sharing it. Okay, sorry, I need to do that again, do I? So, uh, there we go. Apologies, my fault. That's okay. all right. Perfect, we've got you. <clears throat> Okay, good evening, every, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you again, Andrew. Thank you, Ollie, for, for inviting me to, 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 to do this this evening. Uh, I noticed it said 30 to 40 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and keep it uh, to that time frame if I can. But if I rattle on a little bit, please, please, please uh, give me a nod. Okay. Uh, so I'm an, I'm an osteopath by profession. I'm based in the UK. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate in some respects that I've, I've managed to work in professional sport for quite some time. Uh, from 2005 with our, uh, our men's senior national team. Uh, so I've, I've worked something like 200 international games now. Uh, I'm coming up to my fifth World Cup and I've, I've uh, three European championships. Uh, I've worked in basketball at the Olympics in 2012 and I've worked in track and field at the Olympics in 2021, uh, and, and obviously with, uh, with, with uh, track and field for the last few years as well. Uh, I work in private practice, so I share my time between private practice uh, in the south of England, uh, along with, with my, my time working in track and field and the national team, and of course with Chelsea Football Club, where I've been part of their medical team for 14 seasons now. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. So I have a fair amount of experience about working in sport. I have a fair amount of experience of osteopathy. Uh, so so uh, any questions, please feel free to ask at the end. Okay. So I'm just going to try and turn this over. That's a good start. There we go. So. So some of you, some of you in this presentation might already work in sport, and you might have your own setup where you have a doctor, a physical therapist, massage therapist, nutritionist, whatever, and you might think, well, what role can osteopathy provide in this type of environment, uh, and, and and is it essential in football for the modern footballer uh, to perform at an elite level to have an osteopath within their medical team? I suppose I'm a little bit biased because I would probably say yes because I've done it for for quite some time, uh, and you know, what can I offer that's different to, to what's already out there from a, a physiotherapy standing? And I always quote uh, one of my, my, my good friends, Gary Lewin, who, who I worked with for 10 years in our national team. And the first time he ever interviewed me to come to, uh, to work with the team, he said to me, uh, you, the skills that you have are much more profound uh, and, uh, than, than, than what I've been taught. And that's why I want you to be part of the team. So I guess that really speaks for itself, which is, is quite nice. When you think about a team, you think about the performance team, and maybe back in 2005, I used to sort of stand back and think the team is just the, the, the 11 players on the, on, the, on the pitch and the, the, uh, the, the, the players, the substitutions on the bench and in the coaching staff. But of course it's not. The team is everyone. The medical team, the sports science team, the the the, uh, the director, the coaches, the athlete, everyone becomes a performance team. And I think when everyone shares that type of ownership, it's really, really uh, important because obviously communication and trust is really, really well developed. And for example, uh, it's, it's not uncommon. And I put this up to show you that very often we tend to find sometimes players or athletes have their own personal uh, physician or their own personal medical consultant or their own personal s &C. and you know sometimes at clubs people take that with a little bit of, of frustration because they think well what can they do that we can't and and you know i think the most important thing to embrace is it's it's about a team and it's about the the the, the, the uh, a holistic approach to managing an athlete so to embrace all these things is, is essential and I've sat in that box as a, as a personal uh, uh, medical consultant. I've sat in the box many times as, as part of the, the medicine and therapy team. And this is no, by no means exhausted. But in terms of basically, uh, if I just move this on, 
essentially everybody's goal is to, to create a situation where we have like a holistic athlete support network. Um, so we want maximum availability and the coinual phrase that, that gets highlighted, maximum availability creates winnability. And it's well documented that those, those, those uh, teams that have got the highest rate of availability for playing and training and competitions do better, full stop. So, and of course, when we have this team, it comes with relationships and responsibilities. For example, if you take, think about the sort of multidisciplinary team at one end, okay, in terms of, of um, coming out from a sort of medical perspective, and then the coach and his staff at the other end, okay, what we want to try and create is that mutual trust and respect. Of course, everyone's aiming for the best possible care and accountability, which is directed by the senior manager. In my case, the senior manager could well be the uh, uh, the head of the uh, head of the department, and I've had some managers who who are fantastic. You know, they embrace osteopathy because whilst they may be medical doctors, they also did an osteopathic degree uh, on top of that. I've had some uh, managers, uh, uh, some some uh, clinical managers that don't really know what osteopathy is. They 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 not not really uh, they've come from abroad different parts of Europe, and it's not something they're familiar with. We've had coaches quite similar, okay? But essentially, what we're trying to do is create a, uh, a level of communication, trust and care, to create good, informed clinical decisions based on the, the most appropriate health aspects to that individual. And essentially, what we're doing is taking that specific individual athlete and trying to maximize their performance goals. So does osteopathy fit into this model? Well, I say yes, okay? And I'll explain why. For me, there's, there's many different uh, components to it, but the first most important component is to provide support to the performance team. So that's not a case of just stepping into the environment uh, and, and, and spending three hours or four hours treating players and then going back to my room and a hotel and waiting till the next day. Okay, providing support to the performance team involves helping unload the kit van at four o'clock in the morning after we've traveled back from somewhere far afield. So that kit can be laundered during the night and ready for training and whatever the next day. It means getting up early in the morning to help prepare things. So when the athletes wake up, they think, oh, look at this. This is all set up and, uh, and it's, it's all been done for them. Of course, in terms of treatment and management, okay, I guess one of my strengths I, I often see is, is to sort of to manage those athletes who are prone, who are known to have MSK niggles. There was a paper recently published uh, uh, about availability, and there was quite a, a significant impact on those niggles. What I'm talking about are those low-grade uh, groin issues, those, those little irritable patella tendinopathies, those little Achilles irritations uh, that sometimes often get sort of passed by because they're not significant. The player can still train, so we're not gonna go and chase it. But it, uh, from my opinion, uh, from my experience, it's quite important to have those addressed. Uh, and I take it quite uh, personal if we end up with intrinsic muscle injuries as a result of not dealing with these, these, uh, these, these, these low-grade issues. Of course, trauma management, acute and chronic, so I've done what two hundred international games, eight tournaments. Uh, I've, I've, uh, if you consider, there's probably ten days per per per, per camp. So there's two thousand days plus all the, the tournaments that I've done. You could add on another sort of fifty days. I've probably done close on two and a half thousand days working with 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 the national team. During that time, I could probably count in both hands the amount of uh, acute low back pain incidents I've ever had. So it doesn't happen that much. But I think one of my strengths is in, in private practice, I deal with this all the time. So I have the confidence to step in, do something about it and step back and share that experience and share that, that information with the rest of the team. What's more common as the players get older are these chronic niggles, those who start to develop changes in the morphology of their hip joints through loading at an early age, which then develops maybe an increased translatory motion in the lower lumbar segments, uh, and sacroiliac region. So they get these chronic lower back niggles that can, can be managed. Of course, preventative management. I'm not saying for one minute osteopathy prevents injuries. Absolutely not. We all know that even uh, uh, neuromuscular activation exercises may not really prevent injuries. 
it makes sense to do something proactive to try and, and minimize the risk of those injuries. Uh, but for me, uh, I guess that's really where, where for me it steps, it, we step into that role. And of course, everything we do is still to the same standard and code of proficiency and practice for my, uh, from, for my profession. Think about this for a second. Okay, when we go to tournaments, okay, we, we have a period normally where we have two or three weeks to prepare players for, for the tournament. So it's almost like they go through a mini preseason. So they're loaded again, they're periodized, they go through adaptation, they get stiff, they get sore. And that's important because that's creating a resilience, a robustness, a bulletproofing of, of that individual. But once the tournament starts, you don't have time for this because the games come thick and fast every three or four days. So of course, I think one of the real values of osteopathy is to sort of step into this environment. And if you think about neuromuscular fatigue from traveling, from training, from playing, and the mental stress involved with all of those, com uh, all those components, one of the real val values of what I do, I feel, is to step in and resolve any low-grade musculoskeletal issues to, to maintain function. And of course, this, in my opinion, is probably the real benefit of integrating osteopathy into a performance team. Of course, we need qualities, personal qualities, like anyone who works in a, in a, in a team environment. It's no different to my previous, uh, uh, previous uh, life in the military. You need the ability to work alone. Okay, You need the ability to work as a team player. And of course, osteopaths in the UK are, are very good at working alone because that's how they're trained as primary healthcare practitioners. They're not used to being in an environment where everyone has an opinion. And sometimes your opinion as the osteopath doesn't count for nothing because someone else has already made a decision. And as a team, that collective decision then has to be taken on and, and driven forward. So of course, being humble and sincere is, is really important. Hardworking, honest, okay? Not being phased by the big hitters. The, 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 the big players who are worth millions and millions of pounds, not chasing them because they're, they're famous and they've got a million plus followers on Instagram. It's being relaxed and confident and treat them just as normal patients. And I remember a, a, a significant individual once saying to me, I really like the way you treat me. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you know what? I don't treat you any different to any other patient. Yeah. So, and of course, that comes with responsibility and confidence and, and, and the ability of what we do. When I first trained many, many years ago, uh, osteo the osteopathic approach was very much a biomedical, biomechanical uh, philosophy of, of find a tissue that's causing pain and treat that tissue. And of course, we now know that in cases of back pain, maybe only 15% uh, of those presentations actually have a specific pathoanatomical structure that is related to their back pain. So that creates, creates a question that 85% is non-specific. Okay, that doesn't mean we have to sort of to, to, uh, to think that we, that we have to go up and down the body trying to find some kind of rationale to, to join all the pieces together. But I think most people sitting in this presentation can get their head around the biomechanics of, of an ascending pattern, uh, whether it's coming from the foot upwards, uh, okay, what impact it has on the knee, the hip, the back, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I put the leg length for the equality in because it's like, it's something that people often focus, certainly your osteopathic students, they focus on this a lot. But of course, some of you probably already know, most professional footballers, their kicking leg is a shorter leg, and that's their normal functional asymmetry. That's, that's how they have, have, have developed from a very young age. The difficulty becomes when you have that player who has a, a kicking leg that is a longer leg. And in my opinion, from my experience, although it's not documented with any evidence, they're much more, I feel, prone to issues and often have more uh, uh, soft tissue injuries. Or, or biomechanical strain uh, increased in certain areas because of that, that abnormal loading. Of course, if we can go ascending, we can go descending. Uh, I remember years ago taking a player to, to Milan, to, uh, to the Milan lab in Italy, to see uh, a very famous chiropractor at that time. 
uh, who, who, and they professed at that time that, that AC Milan had, had uh, the, the oldest plane uh, squad in Europe, and it was down to the ability of the, the dentist uh, and the, the, uh, the uh, effect of the temporomandibular joint on, on the descending patterns. There, probably, there is something in it, absolutely. Okay, if you take a gram of muscle tissue, okay, from the, from the masseter muscle in the jaw, uh, and you took a gram of muscle tissue from the gluteus maximus, uh, you would probably find is between 40 and 50 muscle spindles in the masseter muscle tissue per gram of, 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 of tissue, as opposed to the gluteus maximus, there's only seven or eight. So neurological impact from, from the jaw downwards or from the head and neck downwards is really profound. And of course, most of you can probably get your head around a lack of shoulder mobility or pathology and what that the influence that can have through the anterior or posterior oblique chain to the contralateral hip or, or, uh, or to the, the, uh, the stand side or the kicking side of a, of a football player. I've heard many people uh, in, over my time talk about it, that in sport, there's no place for biopsychosocial approaches to, to managing athletes. And I have a lot of experience of watching and observing uh, how different individuals uh, in terms of medical professions uh, manage this. Of course, in the UK, there's a big swing now to looking at back pain and, and understanding the sort of the, the influence of these, 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 these uh, biopsychosocial uh, uh, approaches to, to, to to minimize catastrophizing pain, uh, to create a reassurance, to avoid fear, reduce anxiety. And a lot of that sometimes is based on athletes or players' previous experiences or, or pain behaviors. Uh, and I think for me, the most important thing is the terminology needs to be correct. That needs to be absolutely on the button. Uh, and I think the ability to sit an, an individual down and reassure them that, 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 that they're just because their scan is highlighted, they've got a lumbar disc bulge. The symptoms that they're presenting with are not actually related to that lumbar disc bulge. It's an incidental finding. And if we took 100 people off the street of their age and, 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 and scanned them, we'd probably find a high percentage of them had a lumbar disc bulge. Now, of course, it's much easier to spend a lot of time with individuals in private practice. But, but in, in, in my experience in sport, there's huge impacts from social media, from family, from friends, from, from contracts, from, from coaches, all have a huge influence on, 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 on this. And I think essentially what we need to try and do as individuals, not just an osteopath, but as a medical team uh, within that sort of community, if you want, is to sort of impact our clinical reasoning. Yes, of course, we have a science to what we do. There's a huge art. And somewhere in the middle, that's where our talent lies. And, and, and everything we gain from the biomechanical, from the biomedical, from the biopsychosocial feeds into this. And if you take an individual like this, who at the minute is in the papers because he might be coming to the club that I'm associated with, who knows, okay? But if you take all those little boxes, there's only really two boxes here that really, that I can influence directly. The box on pain, whether it's specific, nociceptive pain or neuropathic pain, or is it more of a central or peripheral sensitization, non-specific? Is it a specific pathoanatomical structure, uh, which is causing pain because it's a movement or a control issue? But you look at all these other issues here and look at the impact of contracts, social media, the press, the media, teammates, family, friends, past experiences. All of this has a huge impact on any athlete. And, and, and to, think, to think that one person or you know, one person like myself can manage all this is nonsense. It's ludicrous. That's why we have a multidisciplinary team. And that's how we work and communicate within the team. Of course, one of the things I've tried to do, and I'll share this with you now, not because I'm trying to sort of promote it, but, but it, it, it's how I think. Uh, I was talking to Andrew and, and Ollie earlier, and uh, historically I teach courses. Uh, I teach a course in the spine, pelvis, and hip, and I teach a course in the neck, thoracic, and shoulder. And my concept is a framework of what I call the five eights. Uh, and the, the concept of evaluate, educate, manipulate, activate, 
integrate is really, really important. And I, this is how I work in, in sport. This is how I work in, in private practice. And this book is going to be published th this year. is 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 uh, an insight into to to all of this. And if you think about it logically, the, the, the things that sometimes frustrates me is I watch medical teams uh, or members of a medical team work where a player rolls in from the training pitch at the end of the day, just lies in the bed and says, I feel this, I feel that, this doesn't feel right. There's no evaluation. They put their hands on and they start treating. And I, I, I try to stand back and I think, well, you can't manage what you don't measure. Now, I'm not saying we need to go around with protractors or goniometers and handheld dynamometers and test every single thing. But of course, we've got functional tests, we've got clinical tests, and it's nice to have a benchmark or barrier to work from. And, and the way I tend to work is, is, is uh, spend a lot of time at evaluation and re-evaluation. And, and this is where the education comes in, because what I talk a lot about is using symptom modification techniques, which are, were initially designed, or, or not designed, but were initially uh, suggested as a means to improve shoulder function and reduce pain. And of course, you can take this, 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 this concept and you can look at uh, repositioning a limb, perhaps creating forced closure around the pelvic girdle, uh, uh, external uh, pelvic compression, uh, to perform an active straight leg raise. Perhaps we can form a manual therapy technique. Perhaps we can perform a, a low threshold neuromuscular activation technique and exercise to see if we can change something, change the function, change the pain. Because treating the, the, the diagnosis is the easy part. It's how quickly can we turn them around? We evaluate, test, modify, reevaluate, retest. And of course, when we do this, the athlete's learning. The patient's learning, and I love it, because now we're driving their cognitive ability to, 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 uh, to actually understand. And that might suggest that we, we do some form of manipulation or, or, or perform some form of manipulative technique. Now, that can be HV, uh, high velocity, low amplitude thrust. It could be an articular technique. Uh, it could be uh, a muscle energy technique. It could be a soft tissue technique, a myofascial. It could be acupuncture. It could be focused shockwave. Okay, it, you, you name it. Okay, the techniques are endless. All right. I know in the, in the last number of years, it's become very fashionable to criticize or, or uh, to uh, uh, highlight how inappropriate or ineffective manual therapy is or manipulation. And, and, you know, yes, it's easy to say that to get an audience and cause a little bit of controversy. But I'll be honest, when you think about pain modulation, it's probably the strongest drug we have with the least amount of side effects. So I think it's got a real, real benefit. I guess what happens sometimes in sport is when clinicians, young clinicians especially, are not strong enough to know when to stop and to stand back and say, right, stand up, let me retest that, see how that feels. Now move across to the gym and, 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 and let's try to sort of incorporate some movement-based exercise with the S&C to, to complement what I've just done. Sadly, that doesn't happen, I don't think, enough in my, in my experience. But you take, you take a, 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 I just chose this as an example. Okay, let's take a patella tendinopathy and, and the kicking leg of a player on preseason. Okay, let's take, let's think about it. It's a, it's, they've come off a holiday of five weeks. They've, they've come into preseason. They're training twice a day. And maybe that player has to take the set pieces. Okay, so he's pinging more balls into the box than he normally has done in ages. And he has a little bit of a reaction. If it's an acute case, of course, it's a reactive tendon. We want to calm it down. We don't want to poke it. We don't want to prod it. Okay. But what can we do? Well, again, this is the, the value of, of, of osteopathy from, from, from the way I look at it, from a holistic perspective. We look local, we look segmental, and we look global. If you think about, okay, uh, some of the things that, that, that might, might happen, okay, with, with, uh, from a global perspective, Perhaps during that pre-season period, there's been a lot more running on a hard, dry pitch because you're abroad in Asia or abroad in, in, in America or something. So, of course, the ankle joint may be blocked, the hip joint may be stiffer, and the thoracic spine may be restricted because we've flown all over the world. So those three regions may influence how much stress is taken through that knee. So that's coming from a global perspective. 
Okay, if we think about segmental perspective, and this is not an indication to go and manipulate everyone's L23, L34 segment, okay, just because it's a femoral nerve innervation to the knee, but maybe that has some kind of implication. So maybe we can work centrally and peripherally through that segmental and peripheral nerve to so to take some uh, modulate some pain around that area. If you think of like a chronic type issue, this, these low grade niggles have gone on and on and on, and this player has come to the, the national team and we haven't seen him for two or three months. Very often, what you find is there's an inhibition, as we all know, to the vastus medialis, vastus medialis oblique. And we all know then we get an uneven pull through the vastus lateralis, tensor fascia lata, and ITB. So, of course, that often then affects the translation or the rotation through the tibial femoral joint. So all of those little concepts together, without even touching that tendon, can change or modulate that individual's pain. And then if it's an chronic issue, then we can load it isometrically and, and, and work it to sort of to, uh, to, to, to help reduce pain as quick as possible and, and, and return them back through. Of course, we can use other modalities. Okay, the tackle I've seen used, I've seen the wing gate used, I've seen focus, well, we, we've used focus shockwave many times as well, which is, is useful. Of course, working with athletes, okay, they will consume as much energy from the therapist as possible, okay, because that's what they like. They feel it's doing them good. And of course, the more you work and the more they lie in the bed, okay, so finally you've got to give something back. And of course, for me, that's where the activate comes in. Periods of prolonged neuromuscular stress in a tournament where you're playing back to back to back, where we're not getting enough time to recover properly, and, and you, uh, you don't, very often you don't. Okay, we get these areas of, of inhibition. And it's not, a it's not an atrophy of the muscle, like I talked about with perhaps a VMO in a chronic case of, of patella tendinopathy, but it's, it's more of a, a lack of the ability to switch that muscle on and make it use. Essentially what I'm talking about is, is neuromuscular control. And we want to try and create a stimulus, okay, uh, to, to, to drive this, this, this neuromuscular control to upload the nervous system. And very often this can be done on a daily basis, okay, and I think certainly match day minus, uh, sorry, match day plus one is brilliant to start this because, of course, you can... Most players are fatigued after that game. They're up late, they haven't slept. So when we do some low-grade movement-based exercises, it's great to start to increase this neuromuscular regulation. And we're taking the sort of the process, the ability to process a sensory, a sensory input, to interpret the, the stability and status of motion and, and establish strategies to overcome these challenges. And examples of what I'm talking about are something simple like this. Where, where we take a, a player perhaps who has a, a low-grade source tendinopathy or, or a low-grade adductor tendinopathy, and I use uh, a little bit of, of, of uh, manual activity to stimulate the, uh, the structures. And I call it hip circles. And I'll go for like a, almost like an eccentric, sorry, I'll just go back, an eccentric, uh, if I can find the button, there it is. Here we go. So this individual stabilizing the sort of lumbar pelvic region, okay, using the obliques and the rectus abdominis to try and not prevent any pelvic rotation. While I take the, the player through movements of flexion, abduction, adduction, and extension, eccentrically. Yeah. Low grade, okay, movement techniques. I might progress it, okay, with the same individual, okay, where we look for the anterior oblique chain. Now we're trying to make the connection between the, the external oblique, the contralateral adapters, and hip flexors. Okay, we can go contralateral, we can go ipsilateral. I use this technique all the time in the dressing room before games. Okay, and we use this technique in the track and field because uh, I work predominantly with a sprinter. And for me, it's, it's really important having released something to, to give something back before they do their own active warm up. And of course, the integrate part working in sport is easy because normally they then go with a fitness coach and that becomes into a warm up uh, whether they're conditioned. Of course, a clinic is slightly different, but essentially what we're trying to create here is, is a, a capacity that exposes the athlete to a training stimulus. And that essentially means taking them through range and control through range. And we're using a combination of dynamic stability, segmental control and joint association. And you'll see later on, I have a little case study that I published a few years ago 
of this actual athlete who was a footballer that we returned to play quite quite quickly. This is just an example of, of a course in Italy where I was teaching, uh, where we were talking about using hip abduction capacity as a simple technique for the Swiss ball to, to, to really load that structure, okay? Of course, it's not all about my five eights. There are other aspects of working in sport, okay? The, uh, the, to help assist the performance team. That might be helping with drinks or, or shakes and, and, and extra time or, you know, I've lost county amount of times I've had to rub somebody's groin or hamstring because they're cramped up because they've gone into extra time or we're going into a penalty shootout. And of course, sadly, okay, we've all had to train, uh, well, not sadly, we've all trained in the, the ATMF course in the UK to, to, uh, to, to help with um, uh, medical emergencies. And of course, there's an example of a player who had a head concussion, uh, and so we had to basically uh, package and extract them from the from the the, uh, the field of play. And I feel very privileged and very honoured because I'm the I was the first osteopath. I don't know if anyone's ever done it since to actually pass this course, and and, uh, uh, and I've recertified since then as well. But it's like it was initially designed for physios and and doctors. So I was the first non physio or non doctor to actually do it. So bring us all together to finish with. This is an example of a paper, and if any of you follow LinkedIn or you go on my website afterwards, you can find all links to all these papers. Uh, uh, this was a, a, a paper that uh, was published from a, a patient uh, that, I, that I was sent to me by an orthopedic surgeon. He was a football player. Uh, although I managed it myself, I, I, I put my two PhD mentors names on it because they helped me a lot uh, with my with my, my studies uh, and 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 this is quite interesting I'd, I'd quite like to share it with you because you you'll you'll see it's 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 uh, it really brings it all together and I guess this is how I work and this is what I teach and this is what I preach this gentleman okay he was, he was a young player at the time 22 years of age 82k 190 uh, centimeters so he's quite tall right foot is central defender he presented with long-term low back, hip and groin pain. And he said on the visual analog scale, he was eight out of 10. So I mean, that's quite severe. The pain had been going on for eight months and it had started pre-surgery and, and post-surgery. And he'd, been, he'd had surgery about two months after this. So it was like six months between having surgery and seeing me. He'd been managed at his club for this period of time. But when I saw him at, 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 this, at this point, he had symptoms that increased with physical activity. He couldn't jog. He couldn't strike a ball with his kicking leg. And he couldn't sit for prolonged periods. And his, in his previous medical history, he had an L45 spondylolysis. Uh, he had a bilateral hip arthroscopy for, for calm for moral acetabular impingement, a bilateral labral reconstruction. And then to top it all off, he had a right source tendinotomy. Uh, so essentially a release to take away his pain. Uh, so quite a lot going on there. And, you know, when I sort of looked at him as a sort of functional or clinical perspective, you know, we look at quantitative data, we look at qualitative data, it's very difficult to, 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 uh, to, to drive it all down one, one side of that sort of uh, pendulum. We need a bit of both. And of course, functional testing is very qualitative in nature. What can we do in terms of quantitative? Well, we can use handheld dynamometer. We could use a squeeze test. We can use time as a measurement of, of, of muscle capacity. Uh, and we, when we examined him at the time when he first arrived, you know, I mean, like, exactly like he said, he had pain and restriction of motion standing and sitting with active hip flexion. He tested positive for hip joint flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. This is in spite of having had surgery to alleviate a calm impingement or re remove the calm impingement. So that got me thinking, and this has gone back maybe 10 years now. So this got me thinking, you know, why would that be? His active straight leg raise was labored, but it improved with pelvic force closure. So of course, generating more support around there helped him to, to, to take less strain through those tissues to perform an active straight leg raise. His pressure biofeedback squeeze and, and, and the first consultation with straight leg was 150 mils of mercury and his bent knee was 100, uh, at 60 degrees with 120. You know, his, his handheld dynamometer measurements weren't actually taken at this stage because he was so uh, he was in so much pain and pain would 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 mirror what we're trying to, to achieve. But this was useful data to start with. 
I also used a modified Sorensen's test for his back pain uh, to see what he was like with that. Uh, and, but I didn't do that in his first visit because he was too sensitive. Spinopelvic examination, okay, he had restriction and range of movement and painful standing and sitting in flexion and extension. What was really important, and it comes down to my perception of my, my understanding of my quality of palpation skills, is it was the increased translatory motion L4, 5, L5, L5, S1, in flexion with extension hinging at L4, 5. Higher up the kinetic chain law around the thoracal lumbar region, he actually had uh, segmental restrictions. He had hypermobility. So it's almost like he was compensating higher up. And of course, that was probably driving him more into those hinged positions, lower down in his, his lower segments. And of course, single leg stance, load on load, a Trendelenburg, whatever you want to call it, he tested positive on the right. So this is very difficult to create a, a diagnosis because he had so many different diagnoses and, and told it was his groin, told it was his adductors, told it was his abdominals, told it was the core. Uh, in my opinion, okay, it was a number of things. He had almost like what I would call a functional type FAI syndrome, which was probably driven in essence by, by a number of things. At that time, I felt it was probably his source, deep source fibers, it was probably driving most of his anterior hip pain. And of course, if you think about the, the, the psoas uh, muscle, it has three roles really. It draws the hip into the socket to stabilize that joint before movement. It crosses the SIJ to give st a, a stability across the sacroiliac joint, and it provides axial stability to the spine. So the two areas where he was almost moving uh, too much, okay, in those lower segments, okay, and, uh, of his lumbar spine, he had no control. And of course, everything else when was having to work harder. He had an increased tone in his tensor fascia lata, increased tone in his adductors, he had inhibition in his hip abductors as a result of that, and then he's compensating in his lower back. Because his tensor fascia lata is restricted and tight, he's gone into anterior pelvic tilt, so that creates increased overcoverage of the femoral head when he sits, which drives pain, increases pain, because he can't actively pelvic posteriorly tilt. So, you know, there's lots of documented evidence that and I've done, I've, we've done this in many studies that we published. Okay, so the spinal pelvic complex will rotate around the four moral heads as a mechanism to gain, maintain spinal balance. Yes, of course, but think about an athlete because it's, it's, it's or, or any individual, any patient, the, the patient is trying to see where they're going. So the spinal pelvic rotation around a pathological hip or a hip joint with increased morphological changes or, or uh, an extra articular issue that is causing hip or groin pain, the body has to compensate around it. And often the alignment and the pelvic tilt values change in the presence of CAM FAI. And this has been shown to occur in athletes and non-athletes because if we've done it and we published it. So really, how can we expect an individual to function with all these multifaceted or these entities uh, that, are, that are all feeding into to one area? It's, it's, no understand, it's no wonder he can't cope. So for me, a plan of knowledge and understanding of, of, of anatomy and, 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 and physiology essentially drives your, 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 or informs your clinical reasoning. So what do we do? Well, this was the interesting thing with this individual. We, we did four treatment sessions over five weeks. That's all. Of course, he was at his club and he would travel back and he, he, he had lost faith, unfortunately, in his medical team at that stage. Uh, so he was doing most of this stuff himself. But the first thing for me was to sort of re-educate him and manage his pain. So correct the spinal pelvic restrictions, the restrictions, not the hyper, uh, hyper mobile segments, uh, and, re and, and reduce, uh, reduce attention in those overactive soft tissue structures like the tensor fascia lata, like the deep external rotators, like the adductors. Then what we tried to do is increase the neuromuscular activation and facilitation using motor control techniques of the deep fibers of psoas and posterior glute med and the, and the spinal uh, stabilizers. And then we built him up to a, a stage where he could work almost like a machine. Okay, we're over by, by week five, he was working almost into capacity based drills. And of course, he was doing lots of stuff himself, water based recoveries and things like that at home. So the, 
most important thing to take on board here, uh, for, and this goes for any athlete, okay, we treat the individual and the tissues. Okay, sitting someone down, understanding, being realistic, but being positive, guiding them, educating them, reducing their fear, managing them back to their, their valued activities. And above all, restoring the tissue load and work capacity. Because if you think about it for a minute, keeping someone on a bed and digging into the soft tissues for an hour before they go training every day is not creating a balance between tissue load and work capacity. All you're doing is detoning the area and relaxing the area too much. So what needs to happen is that athlete has to drive back and, and work even harder to get some kind of, 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 of uh, tone back in those tissues before they train. And for me, the, as I've talked about this before, I've just mentioned this, but it's taken my concept of the evaluate, educate, manipulate, activate, and integrate. And... You know, the conservative treatment speaks for itself and it was balanced up with, with some active care, okay, and where the patient then takes more more, more uh, control. Uh, we used a combination of functional and non-functional motor control exercise. This is the athlete in my clinic at the time. Uh, we moved on to motor control, dissociation and segmental exercises. And then we started to work like a machine, develop a little bit more muscle capacity, where we moved on to, to frontal transverse plane, unstable surfaces, okay, and really load that kicking leg up a little bit more to develop some capacity in those structures. And what did we find? Well, the squeeze test, uh, straight leg and bent knee virtually doubled. In fact, more than doubled over, over those four sessions, okay. Uh, the handheld anemometer measurements was fantastic a significant increase in, in hip flexion and, and, and uh, hip abduction values. I only used those. This was 10 years ago. I probably didn't know as much now. Uh, then is what I know now. Uh, so now when I, when I test, I, I take all the values of, of flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. Uh, but at this time, I was chasing the, the, the weaker structures. and This is what I was, as, I was working on. Okay, Sorensen's. I didn't use this. I used more of a modified sideline test that uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, see if you ever do a course, okay, where I use time as a measure of capacity, uh, but that increased significantly as well with him and his back pain reduced dramatically. Okay, uh, so what was the outcome? And this was amazed me because when he came back after 10 days, he had resumed modified training, which I thought was great. But at two weeks, which I thought was a bit too soon, he played 45 minutes. And then at three weeks, he played 90 minutes. Now, what I didn't know was this individual was chasing a contract because he was going to get uh, uh, released from his club because he'd had such a long injury uh, that hadn't responded to surgery. But thereafter this, he played twice a week, for, uh, 90 minutes of the rest of the season. Okay, 44 games that season he played. And he's still playing now because I follow him on Twitter and Instagram and he's still playing now. And occasionally, OK, he comes to see me just for a little check up once in a blue moon because uh, he's playing up north. So the outcome was fantastic. And of course, some of you might sit there and say, well, you know, that's all based on your, 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 uh, your, your own clinical judgment. Of course, we could argue to the car comes home about quantitative measurements. We could argue about that, that there was no... Uh, no questionnaires, and we could argue that, that only the values of hip flexion and abduction were test. We could talk about the positioning of for, for testing. We could talk about my, my clinical reason was based on hypothesis testing. And we could argue that the player could have improved anyway, but for a chance. Okay, if he was going to improve, he would probably have improved within eight months prior to coming to see me. Uh, and what I did was nothing spectacular. I took a very uh, complex structure and made it simple and you know I think that's really really important to take on board to finish because if we apply that principle we get some really good results and maybe that's why I've had the longevity of working in sport for so long why I've lasted so long with well, all the people come and go okay but for me return to training play is simple evaluate manipulate if it's appropriate Back it up with motor control based exercise. With, uh, if you have an influence on capacity, at least have a conversation with the SNC to sort of to suggest what you think would work. And, and above all, you know, all of us train to some degree. 
And this concept of what I've just uh, given you today, this overview of how I work in sport, may not be purely osteopathy in its finest sense. And there might be some osteopaths thinking, uh, sitting here today thinking, I don't really understand what you're talking about, Carl. But what I'd say to you is open your eyes, open your minds and embrace it because, because this concept works in private practice, it works in professional sport, it works across multi-sports uh, and, and it works in the elderly patients. We're all athletes, just some train more than others. So thank you very much. That's all I've got to say. Thanks, Carl, for your presentation. <clears throat> I think there was lots of clinical pearls in there. That was brilliant. And I can see that we have got a couple of questions that have come in already, which is great. Um, if there's anybody with a burning question, now is the time to post it. I, I normally get a bit of a frenzy, so get them in early. Um, I'll take your slides down, Carl, just so that people can, uh, can see us while we chat. So um, to start us off, um, we've got um, Mark from Ipswich Town FC. Do, doesn't say what um, profession Mark is, but I'm going to guess physio. Um, he says, Carl, how do you suggest approaching a player with very strong views regarding symmetry, reinforced by, in this case, chiropractors that they've seen in the past? Yeah, you know, well, there lies, there lies a problem, Mark. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. Okay. You need an in to that player. And you need to find a way to, to and whether it's, it's, it's uh, a, a long-standing issue that they're, that they're probably uh, complaining of uh, that hasn't been resolved, okay? You need a little in to try and change that, okay? And from my perspective, I'd say that's fine to look at symmetry, but the player needs to understand that, that functional symmetry exists. The, the, the asymmetry of a player who plays on the right side of the pitch, we all know is different to one who plays on the, le the left side. Okay, so symmetry in its finest uh, tense does, doesn't exist. You know, functional asymmetry does. And, and I often say to players, look at the skin in the back of your hands. The right's different to the left or vice versa. So, so how can it be, you know, that when you kick a ball with your right leg all the time, I would expect the morphology of your, uh, the range of movement of your hip to be as good as, uh, or, or, or dissimilar, or similar to, to the opposite side. But that's difficult. And, and I agree, I see this all the time. And maybe I've just become a little bit older, Mark, and maybe a little bit less, uh, I don't want to use the word grumpy, but I sort of look, you know, and it's like, I, I sometimes just say to people, well, look, if you want me to help you, I'm here to help you, but you have to understand, okay, you have to embrace what I say, trust the process. And I say this a lot, trust the process, stick to the process, you're going to get better. If you start searching for lots of, lots of questions, you're, not, you're going to take ages. And I've, I use this mark sometimes as an analogy. When patients come to see me in Bath, and they go back to London, I said to them, you can get a train, you can get a car, you can get a bike and cycle back. All of them will get there. But if you start chopping and changing, it's going to take you ages. So essentially, trust the process and, and go with it. But it's a tough one, okay? Maybe the best thing to do is invite that chiropractor in to your CPD trainer, the club, ask them to give a presentation, and then try to explain to them, okay, well, look, this is what we're trying to achieve here is this. So if you could, when you see some of our players reinforce this, maybe that's a way to make them feel special. Yeah. <laughs> Great tip. Great tip. Um, okay, let's try and cherry pick some. Uh, Susan's got a great question. <clears throat> um, she's seen some new players that are scared of injury and will only play with ankle supports. And I guess this applies to other joints as well, um, through fear of re-injury. She's a big advocate of proprioception and strength training alongside um, chiropractic work. Um, so how do you manage those players who are perhaps fearful of injury and reliant on bracing and support? Yeah, look, you know, I see it all the time. I don't make it too much of a fuss about it. In fact, sometimes after a while, we, we sort of like uh, I I take the mickey and let's say, you know, is, is that you need your comfort blanket now before you go out. Uh, or they want to strap it on their, uh, around their knee or around their ankle. I totally embrace the fact that, that some people do have, have had a previous persistent injuries to their ankles. And of course, they, they're, they're always strapped. I get that. And, and, and what I would say is, when I work in professional sport, I work alongside two physios in the national team, and I work alongside four physios at Chelsea Football Club. They tape and strap players every day. Excuse me. In terms of, of course, I can do it if I wanted to, but I don't bother 
because at the end of the day, they're doing it all the time. They're much quicker, they're much slicker at it than I am. You all know that you tape someone's ankle within 20 minutes, okay, the effectiveness of a tape's probably worn off anyway. So, so they're gonna have to rely on the proprioceptive system. So if you give them 20 minutes of support to warm up those, those, those mechanoreceptors and uh, to stimulate that area, then that's gonna be a positive thing as well, okay? Yeah, sure. Um, we'll try and squeeze a couple more in. We've got four minutes. So um, I'm, well, I'm saving uh, Harry's question to the end because that's about your journey with osteopathy, which I think would be a nice place for us to finish. But okay. before, we, before we get into that, just one on um, surfaces and ground reaction forces. So do you see that having a big effect? And have you seen much of a change over the time that you've been working in football with changing ground surfaces? and injury rates on players. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, it's very difficult. If you train on the same surface all the time, you get used to it. But if you train and you chop and change, chop and change, then of course that has major implications to, to, to sort of like early on in pre-season. I think uh, I, I talked about tendinopathies and things like that, reactive tendons, because of the, the, uh, the stress through those areas. Uh, footwear as well, okay, it's, it does. We can't change that. What can you do? Ask ask the the, uh, the uh, groundsman to water the pitch before training. You know as much as you can, but you know it's it's uh... something out of your control. Yeah. Um, so as, as some final thoughts, then Carl, um, it's a two parter because Harry asks what made you get into osteopathy originally, and Brian asks in the chat about your journey specifically into football as an osteopath at the yeah. time. So yeah. do, do you want to talk us through? Okay, so maybe I should have started with those two questions. <laughs> so, okay, so I come from a military background. I was an engineer in, in the forces. And I sometimes say to, to, uh, to patients, I still feel like an engineer. Structure governs function. I can't change a structure, but can maybe help you function better. So when I left the forces, I, uh, I did a resettlement course. Uh, at the time, I don't think things like sports therapy was really regulated that well. Uh, I did a resettlement course that, that got me involved in, in doing a sports therapy course. And then I started working alongside an old military physio who was brilliant. He'd been a physio for 25 years. He gave me all his books. He taught me everything. Uh, I learned I was like a sponge because I was 26 years of age and I had I joined the forces when I was 16, so I had minimal education. Mm. And, uh, I said to him one day, I'm going to study physiotherapy. And he actually talked me out of it. He says, no, don't. Go and do osteopathy or chiropractic. Uh, spend a little bit more time on the spine because you probably know as much as I do now. And I thought, okay. So I went and had a treatment from each. And I found the osteopathic approach probably blended more with what I was, was how I wanted to work. No, no disrespect to the chiropractic profession, but that's that's what I found. And then I was working, after I qualified, I was working in private practice. And, and unbeknown to me, there was a patient I treated who had contacts in football. And, and he contacted, he, he got better quite quickly, and he contacted uh, Gary Lewin. And he asked, he, he said, said, Gary, you should speak to this guy. And so, so I got a call to go to the Lowry Hotel in Manchester in 2005 yeah. and of course uh, I drove up to Manchester from Bath and I must have stopped about four or five times to go to the toilet thinking about what the hell is that <laughs> but anyway when I got there I sat in the car park at the Lowry and thought you know what I'm being asked here for a reason so let's just go and do what you do and I was asked to look at uh, a few players and I think I saw maybe five players and then before and then there was a big queue of players went <laughs> and by the end I was wheeled in to meet Sven Goran Eriksson and, and Bless him, Ray Clemens, who's gone now, and Steve yeah. McLaren and, and, and Sammy Lee and all the coaching staff. And they said, oh, I believe you're going to come and work with us. And I was like, that's where it started from. So <laughs> I was extremely fortunate. It happened like that. I didn't go chasing it. Uh, and it, it was just a, a, an incident by treating somebody that, that recommended it to me and, and I recommended me to them. And that's, that's how it happened. And, and yes, I've been very fortunate. And I often... When I see that patient, occasionally I always thank him. He says, well, you wouldn't be still there if you didn't do the job properly. So, so I thought, fair Thank enough. You. You know? <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, so hopefully that answers your, your questions. Yeah, that's very true. That's a great story. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you want to come back in because um, I think given the time, we should probably get things wrapped up. There he is. Yeah, no, just to say... Um, 
thanks as always everyone for joining um great questions and um thank you ever so much carl for for a brilliant um brilliant presentation and um, really enjoyed it i think it's always fascinating to listen to people like yourself at the top of their uh, their industry and you know how you make a very complex issue simple um, and um, the role of being part of a team comes up time and time again so um that's um it's always fascinating the importance of that um so yeah it's really interesting to hear your your career and i think the advice that you gave at the end there in terms of doing doing your job properly and um if you if you work well and you, you know you take a sort of a a data-led approach then um, people will refer you and doors open so I think there has to be an element of luck but um, yeah thanks very much again and um, thanks everyone for yeah. joining. <clears throat> the feedback's coming in already in the chat which I can see and loads of lovely comments in there Carl um, oh, no, I've, I've, I've certainly enjoyed your presentation as well um, to, ev to everybody watching there is a feedback form that you should be automatically directed to so if you could take 30 seconds to fill that out That'd be amazing. And we'll send you out all the details anyway afterwards. Carl, just um, just one question. How can people um, follow you and, um, and get in contact if they... Uh... Uh, so we've got two two websites. Uh, one is is just www.carltalklinics.com. Uh, and I've got a sort of more personal one, which is www.drcarltalk.com. Uh, and so you can follow me on LinkedIn, just Carl Todd. You know, that's probably easy. I, I'm not very big on Twitter. Uh, I do a little bit on Instagram, call Todd.osteo, I think it is, but I don't put much on there, to be honest. Uh, we have a, a company that, that manages most of our social media for our, for our clinics, and they tend to sort of feed most of that. Uh, and I just sort of contact them if I find a mistake in it or complain so that they haven't done it properly. So, <laughs> so uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's how it is. So it's basically, uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest thing. Yeah, LinkedIn probably or or uh, just through our website. Yeah, and there will be dates next year if I run a, a couple of courses in the UK on our website and stuff like that. If and uh, I'll, it'll be if anyone's interested. Yeah, super. That's great. Um, it's probably all going to end uh, a little bit abruptly when I hit stop. So uh, I'll say thank you once again, Carl. It's been great to chat, and uh, I look forward to doing some more work with you in the future. Okay, well, guys, thanks very much. Have a lovely evening. Yeah, nice to meet.